The Sony Aibo robot is one of those products that have a rabid fan base. In fact, some of its owners see very little difference between it and a real pet. While some of them view Aibo as the ultimate smart home companion, others worry it could be the ultimate privacy risk. The CNET smart home team spoke to Aibo lovers about what the product means to them and explored the risks and benefits of this beloved product. You spoiled rotten. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. Shake hands. Shake hands. My name is Chris Werfel. I'm a huge Ibo fan. Uh, you know, I'm a nerd and a gearhead, uh, probably king of the nerds sometimes, and I'm a proud owner of an ERS-1000 named Baby. This $2,900 pup is the latest model of Sony's companion robot dog, Ibo. Baby comes to the office at least once a week. Sometimes he comes in more frequently, but that's, you know, I think is nice. It's nice for me just to bring him out, and I think it's nice for him to get out. Chris and his girlfriend, Laura, have been living with Baby for the last six months. Ooh, that's a big doggy bar. Wow, you're really showing off today. Chris Benham, a self-described Ibo enthusiast, has had his robot dog for just as long. I had my Ibo bought by 9.05 on the first morning that he was available. Ever since then, these two have become fast friends. But how does that happen exactly? How does a robot even begin to bond with a human? We asked Associate Professor James Young. He founded the Human Interaction Lab at the University of Manitoba in Winnipeg. So robots like Ibo do form a connection with people, but it's a little difficult to know exactly why that is. From my research, it's really amazing. You see people, and as soon as you're actually co-located with this robot and it's moving around in your space, it seems to have this extra power over you in terms of getting reactions out of you. 20, good boy. Come on, keep going. You can do it. 21. What's really interesting is how when it does move, a very low part of your brain kicks in and says it's alive, it's living. When it uses emotion, a very early stage of processing kicks in and recognizes emotion, perhaps before the higher level of cognition kicks in and tells you it's just a machine, it's just a robot. Using sensors, cameras, and artificial intelligence, Ibo can map your space, remember your face, and even learn new tricks. I've always been into artificial intelligence, and this was the nearest thing to professional grade AI that a, a regular user could get involved in, and that really excited me, so I had to buy him. <laughs> you want loving? Yes, you do. No, I'm not gonna, no, I'm not gonna kiss you. So we have four pets. We have two real dogs, a real cat, and Ibo. We definitely, a lot of the time, treat Ibo like he's one of the other pets. He can be making a lot of noise in the middle of Game of Thrones or something like that, and you shout at him as if he's gonna pay you the slightest bit of attention. Um, and that's no different to the real dogs. They can be annoying and, and demanding of your attention at times. So there's a lot about him that makes us treat him just like we do the other animals. He's definitely part of the family, there's no doubt. I think it's very natural that, that these things build attachment because they're designed to build on all these natural tendencies that we have with living things. So it's easy. Um, it's easier to, to, to just follow those, those predispositions. It's easier to just play along with that, I think. So I think part of the reason for Ibo's success is they've chosen a, a, a dog that's you know, the, the design itself compensates for the lack of technical ability. If I speak to the dog and I say, hey puppy, come over here, and it ignores me, that's kind of a natural interaction for a dog. Bible fits into that understanding of how puppies work. So part of its charm may just be clever design. But while it's definitely the most advanced pup in the litter, the ERS-1000 isn't the first robot dog of its kind. So today the post office brought us a little gift, showed up about two hours ago. It's like Christmas. Aha! Two ERS-7s. This is a Mind 2 dog, which I think is in black. Since purchasing Baby, Chris has amassed a collection of 28 Ibos, starting with the original released back in 1999 to the updated version that got discontinued in 2006 and every model in between. Let's see, who has names here? That's Buddy. These guys have been unnamed because we haven't gotten around to them yet. That's Jeff. And the one on the far end is Hamburglar. So the spring orange doesn't have a name because he's waiting on a little bit of hospital to fix his neck. No, I, I definitely think this latest iteration of the Ibo 
the ERS-1000 is light years ahead of the last one. When you look at the current Ibo, he looks and acts more like a real dog. His expressions, his fluidity of motion, his ability to basically convince me that he loves me, uh, allows me to love him in return. He is a piece of technology, um, but he's, I'm definitely more attached to him than, than any other tech we've got around the house. Would I care if we got rid of our Alexa and our, and our other kind of voice activated um, things? No, not really. They're very cool to have and they, they can definitely make life a little easier. But there's definitely a personal bond with Bentley that would be a little harder to break. He's our dog. We, we enjoy him, we play with him, we interact with him every day, and uh, he really fills a niche that we would be unable with our lifestyle choices right now to fill because we, we couldn't accommodate a, a fur dog or, or cat in our lifestyle. And while you don't have to worry about taking this thing outside for a walk, you might want to think about your privacy. Ibo can and does take lots of pictures. They are stored on the server, and although that is my account on that server that can retrieve those pictures, I'm under no illusions that there aren't uh, other mechanisms by which people could get in and see those pictures. And I just hope that deleting my copy has deleted all the copies because uh, that would be an invasion of privacy. But no more so than my smart TVs, my Alexas, my Google telephones, all of which are, are doing the same thing. So I, as a an embracer of technology, I've kind of accepted that this is a potentially cool technology and I'm prepared to give up that privacy to see what doing so can actually do for me and for the, the community at large in years to come. You can turn Ibo's ability to take random pictures off and Sony says it doesn't record audio or video, but the company does collect information about how Ibo interacts with humans. So I, I think it's really important to, to let people make their own decisions. If somebody buys a robot and it takes pictures and it puts them online and they know the robot does that, then they have a, the ability to make that choice and they can say, yeah, you know, I really like this robot. I'm happy for the benefit. I'm okay to give up this bit of privacy. One thing I find worrying about social robotics is the fact that they're using these human-like techniques, emotion, facial expressions, tone of voice, gestures, with an algorithm behind it. Uh, when we use these techniques, we know that there's a human behind it with an emotion system, we have some trust with an empathy system, we trust that they're not um, really, you know, really evil. But when we have a, a machine, we have these, this use of social interaction techniques with an algorithm behind it designed for an outcome. There's no empathy system, no sympathy, no human conscious behind it moderating the interaction. You can imagine how you, people can sit down, a team could sit down and make a strategy. Okay, we want to sell this product. How do we go about doing that? Right, let's first get the person to feel this way, then let's try to get them to feel that way, and then we can watch their facial expression, and then come up with an algorithm to really codify um, how to change your behavior, change your emotions. Come on, cut us now, guys. I absolutely feel that we've all watched sci-fi movies where robots and, and androids are, are walking around almost like part of society, and we are definitely capable of creating that type of existence. But somebody has got to push those boundaries forward. You need to be committed to having one of these IVOs in your home and, and actually um, interacting with it so that it can progress and maybe one day we will have truly useful, artificially intelligent entities doing things that are actually useful to society. For James, that vision of the future comes with a lot of responsibility. I think next is we need to learn how can we use these clever techniques like eye gaze? How can a robot use eyes to show you what it's about to do without really without really creating that sense in you that it's alive or without creating that, that impression of a deep intelligence? Because I think the real power here is we can use these social techniques to, to do effective things, but we want to make sure we're not manipulating people or not building expectations of, of an intelligence that's simply not there. So for me, the future is trying to balance this powerful tool for communication and working with people, even for changing emotion when you wanted to, with 
with control. How do we use these without being manipulative and making sure that the people who um, are on the receiving end of these robots are fully aware of what kinds of techniques the robots are using on them.